Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'd like to welcome everyone. Good evening. I'm Mark Pinto here at Phoenixville Public Library, and it's great to have so many of you with us tonight on Zoom for our presentation. We're pleased to have with us the author of a new collection of historical fiction based on the history of our fair borough of Phoenixville. Joe Varity is a fourth generation Phoenix Villian whose father while growing up often told him interesting stories about the area. Tales of Phoenixville is his first foray into historical fiction. Uh, we like to, you to hold all of your questions until the end. At that time, you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask uh, Joe questions. But right now we'd like to welcome Joe to our program. Joe. Thanks so much for thank joining Thank you us. very much, Mark. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for being here, everybody. As I said, it's a little bit strange because I can't read everybody's faces the way I would with a live audience, but uh, we'll do our best here. So uh, Tales of Phoenixville. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, this is how I got to Phoenixville. This is my great grandfather, Andres Varadi, who came here by himself at age 22, and he forwent the family business and wanted to move to America. And so he had um, friends from Dombrad who had already come to Phoenixville and were working at the ironworks and wrote to him and said, we have work for you here. So he boarded a ship despite his parents being very angry with him and came to America where he worked in the ironworks for approximately 20 years. Um, this is my father, and he grew up on Virginia Avenue, which is on the south side of town, south of Nut Road. And uh, this is, I, I think, in about 1950. And you can see here he has a knife tucked into his belt. He has binoculars. He has a bow on his back, and he has an arrow. And he was quite the adventurous young youth. And so my father is really how I got started with all of this local history. And here's my father in the 1980s, and he's coming out of a mine, a copper mine in Arizona. And you can see he's got the uh, Indiana Jones hat and jacket going on there. So I really credit my dad for sparking my interest in history and especially uh, knowing as much as I do about local history. Uh, so this is my father and where we, he was a rock hound. Um, he was a president of the Pennsylvania Geological Association for a number of years and uh, never had a college degree. So that speaks for itself. So here he has me cleaning some quartz crystals that we had found somewhere before I could <laughs> hardly do anything else. And here I am with him. This is me in the center. This is my mother. And we are at the Schuylkill Ravines. This is next to the Schuylkill Canal and a uh, great place for fossil hunting. And for 30 years or more, he led fossil walks down the ravines until he got sick around uh, 2005 or seven, somewhere in there, I think he stopped. So this is our fair borough, Phoenixville, with the foundry building, the iconic foundry building. And this is how most people see Phoenixville. However, because of my father always taking me around, this is how I see Phoenixville. I kind of, you know, the top is just the top layer. Below us are so many years of history. And um, so this is just a simple timeline I have in the beginning of the book that kind of helps set the stage. The fact that all of our stories take place in this little sliver up here at the top when people came around. <laughs> so you may ask yourself, how did I get here? How did I end up writing a book about all of this? Well, I went fossil hunting with my father, like I mentioned. This is a trilobite. Trilobites are found right here in Pennsylvania. And just an hour's drive or so away, there are quarries where we would go and walk for hours looking for trilobites. Uh, I don't think I ever found anything quite this nice. Um, I, my dad probably did at one point or another. Uh, so these are trilobites. And these are the earlier res earliest <laughs> residents, some of the earliest residents of Phoenixville. Uh, Phoenixville was an inland sea approximately 300 million years ago during the Devonian period, and these little critters were scampering around the bottom of the ocean, as were these guys. This is a bellum night, and these are what the fossils look like. Here you can actually see traces of the tentacles 
uh, the denticles, I guess, in the, the tentacles. And then here there's a rostrum, this leathery rostrum, and you can see it in the animal down below. And that would get uh, preserved. And we've had those found right here in Phoenixville. It's the state fossil in Delaware, very common. Um, so those are bellum knights. And again, this is our fair borough of Phoenixville, approximately 300 million years ago, 350 million years ago. This is a phytosaur tooth that I found on the north side of Phoenixville by the Fairview Tunnel. Phytosaurs are these crocodile-like animals that had their, they were actually different than crocodiles. It's convergent evolution. So they're not related to crocodiles, even though it looks just like a crocodile. Had its nose up here by its head uh, in between its eyes. And this is during the Triassic period here in Phoenixville. So we know that these guys lived here. We have their tracks, we have their teeth. We also had Celiophysis. This was uh, a raptor, small raptor. If you uh, saw the Jurassic Park movies, they had Velociraptors. Velociraptors actually topped off at about four feet tall. These guys were a little bit bigger. They're about six feet tall, eight to 10 feet long. And we had them around here. And we know because we have their tracks. So Celiophysis, you can picture these guys walking around our town. Here's a, another one roaring. You can just picture this. Uh, when I was a kid too, the thought that these things had feathers and were brightly colored was ab absurd, right? Everything looked like a lizard back when I was a kid. So my dad, this is a picture of him with some fossil footprints that he found. These are actually in my basement sitting on a table right now. And uh, these are Rudiodon prints, where, which were a type of phytosaur, the big crocodiles there. And uh, so my dad taught me all about this. And then I got to teach at Berkeley Elementary School for approximately 10 years, 1994 to 2004. And I love to tell these stories to my kids. And this is Samuel Pennypacker. And then if you can see this, this was my original copy of the Annals of Phoenixville, which Samuel Pennypacker wrote in seven, I'm sorry, 1872. And we're so lucky to have this book. And I would read it to my kids in fifth grade. Here's a picture of me teaching in fifth grade, dressed as a Native American. Nowadays, I guess you would say this is cultural appropriation. You wouldn't be allowed to do it. But this was 1995, so we did it. And um, you know, so teaching them about local history, I have behind me a frame of points from Phoenixville. And so I love to make history come alive for the kids. And I would try to read them the stories and tell them about the things that happened right here on the streets where they, they walk every day. And so when I stopped teaching to raise my children, I started writing down these stories and tales of Phoenixville started to take form. Uh, it took me 15 years to write. It's 10 stories and I wrote one every year or so. Um, it was a secondary project, but it was a labor of love. I thought about telling a story about a phytosaur and a hadrosaur. And by the way, the um, paleontologist or whoever did who did this painting, uh, these nostrils should not be here. That nostril should be up here on the head. But he did a great job with the hadrosaur. And we know that these guys lived here as well. But then I thought, oh, it's kind of hard to uh, anthropomorphize um, reptiles. So I decided, okay, here's Phoenixville. We have the Carboniferous period, giant dragonflies, three foot long. We had Demetrodons, uh, sailback lizards. Uh, this is not a Tyrannosaurus rex, but it is what they call a Tyrannosoid. Uh, and they lived here. I forget what exactly his name is, um, the scientific name. And then we have the quaternary period. And this is when humans start to come on the scene. We've got our woolly mammoths, our saber-toothed cats, and of course, our first Native Americans. And so I thought, well, this is probably where I wanted to start my story. So during the last ice age, much of North America was covered with a huge ice sheet over a mile thick. And we are approximately right here. 60 miles south of that ice sheet, you can see right here, it stopped up about Allentown, Easton area, and we're just south of it. So there were lots of fauna here. This was all a green area where we lived. 
I can make that bigger. There we go. That helps. There. So we're we were we're right over here, and Easton is up in here in Allentown. So the the ice sheets a mile thick. They must have been incredible. And the animals that lived here, the megafauna that lived here. Uh, we had, of course, the mastodons and woolly mammoths. We had the saber-toothed cats. Uh, we had dire wolves, ground sloths. Uh, we had our own lions and the short-faced bear, incredible animals that all went extinct approximately 11,600 years ago. Um, this is the La Brea Tar Pits. I went there with my family. Uh, my dad took this photo when I was about eight years old, 1977. And he always said, oh, La Brea Tar Pits is so great, but we have our own tar pit. It's not actually a tar pit, it's a cave. And it's the Port Kennedy Bone Cave. And this is located in Valley Forge Park. And what it was is it was a crevice in a field. It was a cave opening. And uh, due to the long grass, animals would fall in and they would meet their end at the bottom of this crevasse and it would fill up with bones. And so eventually it, it filled in. And when a quarry opened in that spot, they found the, the bone reserve and in the uh, 1800s. So many of the bones were taken to Philadelphia and they're stored there to this day. And we know that there are still bones in the bottom of that pit. And my dad always thought it would be so interesting to be able to open up the Port Kennedy Bone Cave so that Valley Forge would offer not only national history, but natural history. Unfortunately, it's buried under six feet of industrial waste that includes asbestos. And so getting to the Bone Cave is uh, a nightmare. So uh, for now, it's it lays sealed. But we know that these animals were here. We have their fossils. And we know that people were here too. The Meadowcroft Shelter in southwestern Pennsylvania has remains that are 19,000 years old. <clears throat> so these people were probably hunting mammoths. And as much as we like to picture them hunting mammoths like this, I'm sure that there were times when instead it went down more like this. <laughs> and so this is where my story kind of takes place. Uh, I talk about a mammoth hunt. My first story takes place in Phoenixville. These are Indian points gathered in Phoenixville. And it talks about a mammoth hunter uh, whose, whose hunt goes a little bit different than expected. And the exciting thing about the story is that you get to learn so much about uh, what the area was like at the time it takes place right along the French Creek and ends almost where the creek dumps into the Schuylkill River. Um, so these are the Indian points we talked about or mentioned. Uh, this is one of my father's frames. He collected all of these on the north side of town in what had been uh, Johnny Chico's fields up on the north side. And I used to go uh, walking with him many a day looking for arrowheads and spear points. But most of these he found when he was a kid. He always said by the time we were looking, at, there wasn't a whole lot left. But I grew up learning about the Indians that lived here. And they, they lived in these wigwams. They would take uh, saplings. They would take um, flexible green shoots. You can see them building one here, a structure. And they would tie them together with leather thongs or um, uh, fibers, plant fibers that they would make rope out of. And then they'd tie this together and they would cover it with bark. And so they would make these wigwams. And on the north side of town where Friendship Field is now and Reservoir Park, there was an Indian village there. And there were hundreds maybe of these wigwams where people lived, uh, the whole tribe kind of gathered and lived on the top of that hill. Uh, this is one of the long houses, which were also common. Uh, sometimes many families would live in a single uh, long house. And you can see here they had clay pots. We can find that pottery here today. They're cooking it over a fire. We've got fish or something, meat drying on a drying rack. Uh, we've got a mortar and pestle here, right? So we've uh, grinding corn. And again, these are all artifacts that we find here in Phoenixville today. And that's how we know how these people lived. Along the Schuylkill River, they built fishing weirs. They would drive sticks into the bottom of the river and they would weave other sticks in between. 
and they'd make this sort of funnel where the fish would then come into a pool and they'd be trapped in here where they could be easily speared. And they would go after shad. Shad were 10, 12 pounds. Nowadays, if you found a two pound shad in the Schuylkill, it would be amazing. Um, eels, all sorts of fish that uh, I guess today we don't find too much of. Not in the school. You're not supposed to eat them either nowadays. <laughs> We've got the long dugout canoe here that they used to use, sometimes up to 20 feet long. Here I am standing on top of Indian Rock. So one of my stories placed in 1720 called Clash of Cultures uh, deals with a Native American who was tempted by alcoholism to climb this rock and jump off into the Schuylkill River. Uh, they told by some of the settlers that they would give him a bottle of whiskey if he mashed whiskey, if he jumped off. And so that's a legend around here that this is Indian rock. Um, you can see there's a big tree here. And without that tree there, it's a clear jump into the river, which is only about five or six feet deep right here. And of course, at the time, maybe it was a little bit different. But um, either way, from the top, I would never want to jump off of there. Now, it might be a legend. Um, there Maybe it didn't happen. But at the core of every story is a kernel of truth, right? So perhaps it did. So uh, in my book, you learn about the Native Americans and uh, the legend of Indian rock. Here's a picture of a early sailing ship. This is about 1680 when William Penn came over to America and with William Penn came a man named Charles Pickering. Now here I have a four part, just to show you how I do some of the illustrations in my book, um, since I really don't know and can't draw from memory what exactly a uh, 16th century ship would look like, I'm sorry, 15th century, I guess. Um, I, I got a picture, I trace over the, the to get my basic outline and then I start filling in details and this is what I came up with in the end. So this is Galena. This is what Charles Pickering came here for. Uh, actually, he was hoping for gold. This is a lead ore, but it is indicative of silver. So Charles Pickering came here with William Penn. He was a treasure hunter. And he came up the Schuylkill River. They landed here in Philadelphia, if you can see down in the lower right. And after equipping himself and going on a solo expedition, Charles Pickering made his way up the Schuylkill River, and he was panning all the way, looking for the minerals that would be indicative of the, the type of ore deposits he was looking for. He made it all the way up, and here this is the Pakiomink, what we call the Perkiomen Creek now, past these Indian villages at the mouth of what we now call Pickering's Creek. And at Pickering's Creek, he followed these tracings all the way up the creek until he found a deposit of Galena ore. And then he went back to Philadelphia. He came back with two other gentlemen and they did a mining expedition. They came up with eight flour barrels full of ore. They sent back to uh, England to get refined. So the ore came back. And uh, well, before we get to that, this is Tinker's Cave or one of the possible locations of Tinker's Cave. I know you can barely see it here in the woods. Let's go closer. When uh, Charles Pickering came up the, what we now call Pickering Creek, he built himself, he and the other gentlemen built themselves a shelter. And this is one of the possible locations that my father had identified for what they call Tinker's Cave. Tinker was the name of the man he had brought with him to uh, help with the mining. And uh, this hill that it's located on is called Tinker Hill, just off of Creek Road. And so this is a very old structure. Um, is it Tinker's Cave? You can't be sure, um, but it is very old. One of the other locations for Tinker's Cave is right here across from Baker Park. This is YMCA over here, for those of you that know, along Pothouse Road. Well, this is Creek Road that runs behind the YMCA, and there's a little creek that runs uh, under the road there. And this is one of the other locations for Tinker's Cave, according to the descriptions, but it's on a floodplain. So unfortunately, it it would have been washed away. But uh, Charles Pickering, let's get back to him. Okay, so Charles took his silver, 
and he got it refined and he brought it back. And by the time that ore went all the way across the ocean and came all the way back as silver, he didn't want to be a treasure hunter anymore. He said, you know what? I want to be a lawyer instead in Philadelphia. So he took his silver and he mined it in, or I'm sorry, I didn't mine it, milled it into Spanish bits. He basically turned it into currency, which was sorely needed by the colonies. And uh, he circulated his currency and was soon called into court under indictment of counterfeiting by none other than his friend and the governor, William Penn. <laughs> so he had to pay back all of the uh, debts with real Spanish bits and take his silver and melt it down. Well, two centuries later, this is the Wheatley Mine and this is the smelting tower at the Wheatley Mine. And these are my two kids. My father had taken me here on this day and uh, it turned into a very profitable silver mine for many years. So uh, Charles Pickering was on to something and we now know Charles Pickering by Pickering Creek, Pickering Run Apartments, Charlestown. Um, I'll probably think of some others. Okay, Pickering Run Road, uh, there's a bunch. I live right near Pickering Creek. So after 1680s, we're going about 40 years ahead here in the 1720s and we started to have other European settlers coming in. And this is the Star Farmhouse built in 1732 by the Starr family and is the oldest structure still surviving here in Phoenixville. They had built a log cabin before that, uh, as had a, a man named David Lloyd. So there were some log cabins here. Uh, there was the Indian village. And, uh, and then they built this house out of Fieldstone and it still stands there today, which is really interesting, I find. So let's talk about what was happening about 1740 here in Phoenixville. I have a story about the Buckwalter Farm right here on Buckwalter Road. It's still located there. It was actually my first job was uh, moving hay bales up into the loft on the Buckwalter Farm. Um, I can remember walking down to Forestas along the railroad tracks. Well, at that time in 1740, this was all unbroken wilderness and the Buckwalter Farm was just on a little path out here in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Charlestown at the time was only like two or three buildings uh, and they were small. Uh, the nearest neighbors to the north were two miles, three miles to the north on the Star Farm, the farmhouse I had just showed you in the last picture right here. So the Buckwalters live way out here. And one night, one of the Buckwalter girls was sent out after the cows and the cows were sent to roam in the woods and to forage for themselves during the day and were brought in at night. Well, she went out to find the cows and the cows were very far away. And by the time she found them, dark was coming in and she couldn't make it home. So she was stuck out there in the middle of the woods with her herd of cows and they were being attacked and harassed all night by wolves. So if you could imagine packs of, or a pack of hungry wolves right here in Phoenixville, and uh, the story must have been, well, the encounter must have been incredible. We know the story, again, through Samuel Pennypacker's uh, 1872 book, Annals of Phoenixville, he tells us this story. So basically what I did was I put these to a narrative because the stories in uh, Annals of Phoenixville were dry and the kids in my fifth grade class, uh, while they sat through them, I don't think they got out of them as much as they could have. So I put these stories into a narrative form, which is the only reason why it's labeled as historical fiction because you know, I had to fill in little gaps in order to, to present it as a story. But everything is based on as much factual evidence as I had. Again, this is uh, some people are interested in how I do my illustrations. Uh, I just I went online. I found a pack of wolves here. I found a uh, very interesting shaggy bovine, similar to the kind they probably would have had around 1740 here. They wouldn't have had the short hairs, maybe like we have now. Um, this is actually an Ice Age oxen right here in Aurochs, and he's being attacked by dire wolves. So I took all of these and I made a mashup down here in the lower left, you can see. And then that became my uh, basis for my sketch then that I did. And that's how I come up with my pencil sketches. 
So here it is, Buckwalter Road and Charlestown Road. We just talked about these individuals. We talked about Charles Pickering. Charlestown Road is named after him. And uh, my story is about Lizzie Buckwalter. We don't really know which of the Buckwalter children it was. It was one of the girls. Um, I did some research into their family tree and uh, you know, a 50-50 chance I picked uh, Elizabeth, Lizzie. She was about the right age for the time. But here's, this is a whole bunch of history right here in this road sign. And every time I pass it, I think of these stories. So the Battle of the Clouds. <clears throat> we often think that there weren't any battles here in Phoenixville, near Phoenixville. Excuse me a second. We know that Valley Forge is where Washington spent the winter. Then we think, oh, there weren't any battles. Well, this is the Great Valley right here. And we have uh, Exton right here in Route 30. And at one point, Washington, before his army was formed into an army during the winter of 77 and 78 in Valley Forge, he was harassing the British. Uh, they had chased him all the way down from New York and chased him all the way across the Delaware, and now we're chasing him around in southeastern Pennsylvania. Washington had lined up along one side of the Great Valley, and the British had lined up on the other side. Um, and you may have heard of Mad Anthony Wayne. Well, Wayne here is named after him. And there was a massacre, actually, at, of Wayne's men by the British. But either way, okay, let's get back to our story. The British start marching across the valley, Washington's men are way ill-equipped. They're about to get absolutely trashed here. And the skies open up with a huge nor'easter. Nobody saw coming and the battle was over. Everybody was drenched. Washington uh, and his men retreated to Warwick through uh, Yellow Springs. So he would have come right here by my house. 10,000 guys would have been coming through the fields and down the muddy roads in the middle of the night during this hurricane weather um, to try to get to safety. And then um, the British came into Phoenixville, which brings us to our story. So here is the Great Road, what we now call Nut Road, also called Nut's Path to the Forge. It was built by Samuel Nutt, who owned a bunch of forges, and he wanted to connect them. So one was the Valley Forge, and another was the Warwick Forge, and another was the Hopewell Forge. And he wanted to link all of his forges, so he paid a team to go through the wilderness and cut him a road to cut down the trees and move the stumps so that they could get wagons through. And that became Nut's Path to the Forge. Well, after a while, Nut's Path to the Forge became more established and became known as the Great Road. Well, if we turn on the Great Road, this is Route 29 right here, if you can see my cursor, and we're heading up past the hospital here to the high school, and right behind the high school is the Meadowbrook Farm, and living on the Meadowbrook Farm at that time was the Coates family when the British came through. They marched right down the Great Road here from Nuts Path to the Forge, heading west. And they stopped right on the Great Road right here, 14,000 men. Uh, we had the British on the north side of the road where Barclay Elementary School is and the body of town. And then on the south side of the road was the Hessians. And the, the Hessians, apps, they were hitting everything. Well, so were, I'm sure, the British. Uh, they were pillaging and taking whatever they could. So they took everything they could from the Meadowbrook Farm and the Coates family. And so we have this really interesting story in Annals of Phoenixville about a young man on the Coates Farm. And uh, again, we don't have his name, so I did some research and I picked Jonathan Coates. He was about the right age. They all had like 12 kids and they were all only two years apart. So, but I picked Jonathan. So Jonathan, and his family are standing on the uh, porch of their house watching everything get taken away. And the last goose was running around the pond trying to evade a large Hessian man who finally ran it down. And he grabbed the goose and he throttled it. And as he's walking by, he sees the family on the porch looking at him distraughtly. And he tries to cheer them up uh, by holding the goose aloft and going, this goose be good for the poor Hessian mans. 
at which point uh, Abigail Coates ran to the railing and said, I hope you choke on it. And he, he cursed at her and marched off with the goose. And so this story again comes to us through Annals of Phoenixville uh, by Samuel Pennypacker. And you can picture that story being handed down. Well, one of the things that the British took that day was uh, Jonathan's horse. And oh, this is how I do my pictures. Here, I took a, a picture of a typical Hessian and I wanted to make him more portly and have a you know, expression on his face. So I just, you know, took a face. I, I stretched out the body here. And again, that became the foundation for my, my later drawing. So this is Cornwallis. And Cornwallis was in charge of the British part of the army. And then there was uh, Nosshausen, who was in charge of the Hessians. And then there was General Howe, who was overseeing everybody. Well, Cornwallis here, he comes into town and he goes to the house of, I think it was Benjamin Boyer. I'd have to check the name for short. Benjamin, one of the piece. So um, he comes into the house and uh, the farmer had brought the beehives inside to keep them from being plundered by the British. They put sheets over them and brought them inside and had ropes tied around so the bees couldn't get out. And Cornwallis comes in and he says, what's under these sheets? And his men said, oh, beehives, sir. And Cornwallis said, oh, they're pulling your leg. It's not beehives. They're hiding their valuables. And he whips the sheets off and it was beehives. And they buzzed around him and stung him a whole ton of times. And so Cornwallis was laid up when Jonathan Coates, 10 years old or so, um, went looking for the commander of the British Army. He couldn't go to Cornwallis. Cornwallis was down and out with bee stings. So he actually went and found General Howe. This is a picture of a young General Howe, I think, during the French and Indian War. He was older when he was here. So Jonathan Coates actually gets an audience with General Howe. And General Howe sits him down to tea, and they have a talk. And I, again, have to fictionalize some of that talk in my book, Tales of Phoenix, Phil. I have to kind of guess. But uh, given the fact that the young man even got an audience, he must have been pretty articulate. So uh, I give the conversation as uh, best I can, uh, what I, I thought it might sound like. So Jonathan's sitting there talking to General Howe, and General Howe is telling him, look, I'll give you your horse or another horse if you'll just go and spy on the Americans for me. Just tell me, you know, where are they? And it'll um, actually save lives. It'll save your neighbor's lives. And he's like, uh, the boy said, no, I won't do it. It's a base act against my neighbors. I'll never be forgiven. You don't have to live here. I have to live here. And so Howe offered him six guineas in gold and his horse if he would do this. And the boy was very indignant. How dare you try to bribe me with gold? No way I'm doing it. And Howe finally said, all right, you win. Here's a pass. Go find your horse. And Jonathan Coates went off to find his horse. So very interesting story. Uh, me being a fifth grade teacher, uh, I've had some interesting kids to, over the years, some kids very articulate and sophisticated beyond their years. And I kind of picture this boy, Jonathan Coates, being one of those kids, you know, and I've had some conversations with kids that it's like, wow, you're only 10, huh? <laughs> and so I kind of picture that conversation being one of those. Hey, let's jump ahead from the Revolutionary War to the 1880s. And this is the Sundance Kid, Harry Longabow. And um, I think this is a mock-up of a real uh, reward poster. So Harry was born in Montclair and grew up in Montclair. I think he also, for a time, lived in on the other side of the river here in Phoenixville. But he certainly haunted the, the streets of Phoenixville as a kid. And so again, me being a fifth grade teacher, I would tell my kids about uh, the Sundance Kid. And this is of course, Robert Redford and his rendition of the Sundance Kid. And he was known as a Sundance Kid because at age 15, he took a wagon train west and went to a, um, went to a ranch called the Sundance Ranch. And one day he stole a, saddle and a gun <laughs> and he took off and they caught him and he went to jail and so they called him the Sundance Kid and after that he joined a gang 
and was known as the fastest gun in the Wild Bunch gang, but oddly enough, uh, never reputed to have any ever killed anyone. So he, they were the gentleman outlaws, kind of along the lines of uh, Jesse James. So I thought in my story, let's see, how would Harry Longabow have come about becoming this person? And so here he is with his wife, Etta. And so I talk about Harry's early years and he's reading a um, dime novel Western and he's reading about Jesse James and he's imagining being like Jesse James and, you know, uh, playing around down by the Columbia station, a train rolls up and he jumps into the empty box car with finger guns saying, this is handsome Harry, the outlaw. And, you know, I've known enough fifth graders to know that's the kind of thing kids do. I'm still a kid myself. So I could just picture old Harry long about dreaming about being an outlaw someday. So this is the long about grave in the Morris cemetery. Morris Cemetery was the Morris Woods when the Hessians were here that I told you about earlier. And they camped all through this area. Well, now the trees are gone and it's the Morris Cemetery. It's the Borough Cemetery, the public cemetery. And um, this is the Longabout Grave. And in 2017, a show called Town Trekkers visited the Longabow grave with ground penetrating radar. I do believe it was from the University of Westchester. And off to the side in an unmarked grave, there is an object buried eight feet down the size of a coffin. So did Sundance and Butch Cassidy die in Brazil as is most commonly believed Mm, we don't think so. We think that what happened there, they killed some outlaws and then somebody else said, yes, that's Butch and Sundance. And it was one of Butch and Sundance's buddies, of course, somebody they paid off, this owner of a mining company. And they said, yeah, that's Butch and Sundance. So then Butch and Sundance basically went and lived the rest of their lives in anonymity. Um, Butch Cassidy living the rest of his life out in Arizona. There's a lot of good evidence for that. And Sundance, apparently, uh, making his way back to Phoenixville. And living here, there are um, accounts of him living here in his older years. And it's possible that he was buried in secret in the Longabow plot. And that's why he would be buried two feet lower than the average six foot. So that if you dug down there to put a coffin, you dig six feet down, you're not going to hit him. He's two feet lower. So uh, yeah, secret grave. Is it Sundance? Sundance Kid buried right here in Phoenixville. Phoenixville, 1905. This is looking down Main Street. Uh, Brown's Cow is right over here to your left, the ice cream place. I think they just closed actually. This is looking right downtown. There's now tattoo parlors over here on the side. I taught my first karate class in an apartment building right here above what's now Grace Tattoo. And then uh, you can see across here would be the low bridge and here's the north side of town. And here's the trolley going down and we still have horse and buggies going. So this is Phoenixville in 1905 about the time that Harry Houdini visited our town. This is what the trolley looked like, the Montgomery and Chester Electric Railroad. And it went from Spring City into Phoenixville. And it went past the Bonnie Bray Electric Park, uh, which was, they had a zoo there. They had monkeys. They had all kinds of animals. They had uh, rides. I imagine it was just a carousel. Uh, at the time, I'm not sure what other rides you had in 1907, 1917, actually, is when uh, Houdini visited. But the railroad ran for a number of years. And um, here's Phoenixville at that time. And this is where Harry played the Colonial before it had its big, iconic uh, facade that we have in the front that you see in the blob. It just had this little uh, theater facade here, ticket booth in the front. And uh, I put in a safe because that is what Harry escaped from here in Phoenixville. Um, this was an escape that he did not normally do. So he did not normally do the safe escape. So, and I don't think he traveled with a safe. 
So I have them bringing the safe from across the street at the Woolworths as a part of a promotional gig. Uh, yeah, we really don't know for a fact where he got the safe, but we do know that Harry Houdini did a safe escape at the Colonial. Now, when Harry would come to town a couple hours before his show as a promotion for the show, he would do his famous straight jacket escape. And so we don't know that he did this in Phoenixville, but uh, the Woolworths building was right across the street. Yeah, the Iron and Steel Company would have been easy enough to set up a pulley, you know, get out the fire department and set it right up for you. So uh, in my story, I do have Harry doing a straight jacket escape, although we don't have historical evidence that he did, but we don't have historical evidence that he didn't either. So we have very little uh, knowledge about what his show contained at that time when he came to Phoenixville, particularly. I mean, that year, we know what his general show uh, bill was, and we can estimate what he did here in Phoenixville. This is the Woolworths that was located right across the street, the five and 10 cent store. Uh, this is now a barber shop here on the corner. And if you walk down here, Reeds and Company and whatnot is down this way. So this is the corner of Main Street and Bridge Street at uh, approximately 1917, 1920. And here's Harry. I did a mock-up of him on stage doing his escape from the safe. And so for every story, I did meticulous research, uh, which is why it took me a year and a half to write every story. And so when it came to who, my Houdini story, uh, I had to do all this research on Harry Houdini. How does he do, do his escapes? How did he? And so I had to you know, they don't tell exactly how he did these things. So we had to theorize a bit. How would he get to the mechanisms inside of a safe, especially a safe that wasn't his? Um, so very interesting. What a character this guy was. An incredible person. Let's go to 1950s. This is 1958. And here is the blob or what remains of it in a bucket. It's drug out every year for the blob fest, which is our big uh, celebration we have here in Phoenixville to celebrate our own horror movie, The Blob. And I talk all about how The Blob was created in my story in um, Tales of Phoenixville. Let's see, what did I name that story? Hollywood on the Pickering. Now that's because right down the street from me, Pickering Creek runs, and that's where Yellow Springs is. And Yellow Springs, actually where George Washington built the first military hospital in the United States. Well, it was a film company and uh, they made Christian films at the time when they were approached by a director who said, I wanna make a horror movie. And so they said, okay, sure, we'll give it a shot. And so in just a matter of weeks and on a short budget, they managed to make a horror film called The Blob. And I talk all about how the writers uh, came up with their idea and how they filmed. And so these are some of the places in Phoenixville where the blob was filmed. The doctor's office scene is right here across from Reeves Park. Uh, if we go up the street, this is Barkley Elementary School where I taught and I would, so the, in the movie, I'll go to the next one. This is Barkley Elementary School in frame three. Here's the doctor's office across from Reeves Park. And then uh, down here, so this is Barkley. And in the scene in the film, they go up to the building and they need to get fire extinguishers, but the building is locked. So they run down the stairs here and they grab a rock and they come up the stairs and they break the glass. And I would show this film to my fifth graders and I would tell them and that rock is still out there. And every year, sure as anything, some kid would come back in the next day going, Mr. V, look, I found the rock from the movie. <laughs> Eventually, they paved that area over for drainage, so uh, you can't find the rock anymore, but you know, not like it was ever the rock anyway. Uh, this is a garage that was up on Mauer Road. Um, it's right here. It's right by Rita's Water Ice, if anybody knows that. The building was just recently torn down, actually, but that's where they filmed the garage scene. And then number four is the Colonial Theater. And um, I just recently found out Thanks to some of my friends at the Historical Society. There was another scene filmed right here behind the hospital. That is where uh, Jenny's, Jane, sorry, Jane's uh, family, where their house scene was. Okay, so that was pretty cool. So here's the scene in 
the garage at Mauer Road where the blob eats the guy under the car and starts to get bigger. And of course, the famous scene at the Colonial where everybody comes running out. So here we go at the, uh, at that time, we're at the 1950s, 1957. This is Phoenixville. This is when my dad's growing up. And this is the iron and steel plant. And it is huge. Uh, the foundry building it's left is right over here. And you could fit 10 foundry buildings in this building over here. These were made uh, to make rails. Uh, and there's another huge building over here. They, the trains ran right into here so that they could be loaded, they could be taken out. So the foundry building that we still have today is incredible, but these other buildings that are no longer with us are, are huge. They were just ginormous. Um, here's Puddler's Row, Nailer's Row. I'm sorry, Puddler's Row has been ripped down. Nailer's Row right here is part of the original housing that was built uh, for the iron company, and it is still here. And when my grandfather came, he lived up here on Walnut Street. So this is my dad and I before he passed away, a couple of years before he passed away. And uh, one more time, just like to thank him for igniting this interest in local history and you know taking me around and teaching me all the things that he did. Uh, if he hadn't done that, you know, I wouldn't have never had the book and uh, wouldn't be able to share this with you all today. So I'd like to thank him. And if he was with us today, I'm sure he would have plenty to add to my presentation. He had all kinds of stuff I never got to learn. I wish I had. This is a scene from the blob where they're dropping it in the Arctic and they ask the end. And then Steve McQueen says, or one of those characters, I'm sorry, at the end says, yeah, as long as the Arctic stays frozen. Well, here we are in 2021. <laughs> Let's hope that blob doesn't come back, huh? So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you very much. Uh, Tales of Phoenixville, historic fiction, but all based in as much truth and packed with as much educational uh, facts while still entertaining, as I could call it, edutainment. So I hope you are edutained by Tales of Phoenixville. I'd also like to thank Mark for having me tonight, and I'd like to thank uh, Phoenixville Public Library. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. And I didn't realize that we had a scene from the blog filled right across the street from us, so <laughs> that's pretty thank amazing. Uh, so Joe, where can people get your book? It is available at the Gateway Pharmacy. They are all autographed at the Gateway and Reeds and Company has them, but they're not autographed from Reeds and Company. You can also order it online at Amazon, but I know a lot of people don't like to go to Amazon. Uh, but yeah, if you check online, there may be other booksellers online that also carry it. Yes. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Did the Coates Farm have any connection to Coatesville? It does. That is the Coates family. Yes, it is. And so they settled all throughout this area. Uh, so Coatesville um, and Moses Coates came down here to Phoenixville and they had the, um, the farm there right behind the high school. Feel free to unmute yourselves, folks, if you'd like to ask Joe a question. Yeah, please. Or you can type in the chat, but go ahead and unmute. Uh, this is Mike Ponzio in South Carolina. Fascinating presentation, Joe. Thank you very much, Mike. It's an honor having you here, sir. Thank you. Uh, I've read your martial arts books. They're fantastic. This will be my next book, for sure. Oh. <laughs> Great. Excellent. If anybody doesn't know, uh, Mike is also, also an author, and he does uh, genealogy history, so his stories all have to deal with the Ponzio family through the generations in Europe. I find his, uh, his work incredibly interesting. So thank you so much, Mike. You definitely uh, were an inspiration for me to write my own. Thank you so much. That was actually a question I was going to ask you, Joe. Um, what other books or authors inspired your uh, writing? Oh, yeah. So there's one of them right there, uh, right. Mike Ponzio, right? He kind of led the way, showed me that this could be done. <laughs> um, but this book, which I guess you can't see because there's not really a title, but there we go. Annals of Phoenixville, 
Oh, good old uh, Samuel Pennypacker. I love this book. And there are still tons more of stories that I didn't get to uh, that he mentions in there. So without that book, uh, my love of history wouldn't have gone nearly as far as it had. Um, I, I, that's my, this is my treasured copy. I've, my dad gave me this copy. Actually, no, he didn't. I stole this copy from my dad. He lent it to me. I never gave it back. And, uh, Hey, so that's the way the cookie crumbles and, uh, love that book. Yeah. I've, I've read it till it's almost falling apart. Any other questions, comments for Joe? I had a question. Um, I also enjoyed the martial arts books too, and looking forward to the next one. Are you Thank going you, to do another one like this one? I would love to do more Tales of Phoenixville. So I do have a lot of different stories. Um, right here in uh, Kimberton was the first penicillin lab. So without the lab here in Phoenixville, there wouldn't be penicillin. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. We had a huge hospital here, the Valley Forge Military Hospital, uh, the very first military hospital built by uh, Washington, like I said, right up the road from me here in Yellow Springs. And then they built a, a really large one where people came from, uh, unfortunately, wounded vets from World War II, Korea, all the way up through Vietnam. And uh, so there's got to be a ton of stories from the the vet hospital there it was its own city they had their own bowling alley their own movie theater their own dance hall uh and so i think that there's probably still people alive that i could interview and get some great stories there and we had a flood here in 72 hurricane agnes and uh my father was the head of the dive unit here at the time in phoenixville so he spent uh three days rescuing people by boat uh, we didn't see him. And so uh, lots of stories there, too, I'm sure that were uh, exciting. And again, I just need to find the right people to interview. But yes, more tales of Phoenixville may be right around the corner. Joe, hi, I have a question. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed what you said. I enjoyed the whole presentation and, of course, the book. Thank you, Larry. Um, you, you said you'd spent about 15 years gradually building up this book. And yet in the last few years, you've really become prolific in your writing as far as getting it out there. And I just wondered whether something had changed for you as a writer that it allow yes. you to literally produce that level of work. My kids got old enough that I finally could dedicate the time to bring these projects to uh, to a head, right, to culmination. Uh, so yeah, lots of projects that I had, lots of irons in the fire, but with two little kids, um, things are slow and you just gotta learn to go at their pace. So yeah, now that my kids are older, it's given me the freedom to uh, to be way more prolific. Yes, absolutely. So I've turned my love into my work. Do you, do you find that um, that in the time that passed between starting the projects and where you are now that you've revisited a lot of your early writing and sort of changed how you, how you write stylistically? I'd like to think my writing got better by the end of the book, yes. <laughs> now, the stories weren't written in chronological order. So um, the first story that I wrote was actually the Charles Pickering story. And I think that you can, when you read it, it does have a lot of, um, it has a lot of facts. And uh, I, we went over that a lot to make it more readable. And as I went, you know, I'm sure that anybody here, you know, Mike, authors know that, you know, your second book's better than your first. Well, I, my second story was hopefully better than my first. And yeah, by the end, I feel like uh, I was getting the hang of writing dialogue a lot better. Uh, as opposed to just presenting facts and making it more of a, a readable story. There's a question in the chat. Which research for uh, this book did you find most interesting? Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to say the last story because I didn't know all of the intricacies about the Phoenix Iron Company. And my last story is the rise and fall of Phoenix Steel. It's actually called The Curse of the Old Mill, 
the rise and fall of Phoenix Steel. And so uh, an old mill had been built there and I knew the history of the mill and I knew that uh, a lady had been evicted from the mill, her and her family back in the early 1700s and uh, she put a curse on the place. So uh, she said, anybody that does anything here, you're gonna fail. And, uh, and that's what happened. And so as I did my research, I, I really liked learning all about the different um, forms that the iron company took and how over and over uh, it would get washed away. So the first nail works, they build a, a huge dam, they build a saw works, they have the mill, uh, the grist mill, and uh, they build a big dam to power it all and the, the dam fails and it all washes away. And so they rebuild and uh, it breaks again and it all washes away. And these guys rebuild again. It's just absolutely incredible that uh, they stuck to it when most people would have given up. Actually, the man who did that, he lost all of his money, ended up going to the poorhouse. Uh, but it, it's what became the Phoenix Ironworks. And uh, the story, just as the Ironworks evolves up through the years, is very interesting because Phoenixville is so intricately <laughs> tied to it. See my son sneaking by there. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm curious as to whether you would happen to know anything about those high black berms in Valley Forge along the river that whether they're from the, uh, the river being sort of dredged or, or where they came from. Yeah, okay, so are you talking uh, behind Washington's headquarters? Well, no, actually along this sort of river, river walk down in the park and then if you go down that sort of path along the river, there's this high, uh, I don't know, berm that kind of goes along the river for a while and then it goes back, you know, at 90 degrees and it's kind of black, black soil, which is not like the other soil. And, you know, somebody once mentioned that the river was sort of, you know, got sort of shallow from, and so they kind of but, but I, didn't, I didn't really know. And I've always been sort of curious because I've walked there for years and kind of never knew what those were from or why they were there. Oh, that's it. I'm going to have to check that out. I'm not sure, but I'll do a little research and see if I can find out. Huh, okay. All right. Thanks thank for you. the question. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't have an answer to that's that okay. one. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting. Well, thank you very much. For the story on that in your next book, right? Okay. There we go, right? <laughs> Uh, I definitely have one for the milk train. I'm working with a man named Joe Romano's way into the local railroads. And we had a milk train that ran up uh, generally parallel to where 113 is now. It would stop at all the farms. It would collect all of the milk in the morning before daybreak, get it all into Phoenixville so that it could be delivered by the milkman. And well, one day there was a terrible crash and uh, the, the milk train was never rebuilt. But uh, yeah, that's another story for Phoenixville. Uh, the, there was Meadowbrook. Uh, well, we used to get milk up, up here in King of Prussia at the uh, at the farm with the rooster. They used to have some bottles from Meadowbrook. Uh, yes. yes. So maybe they were from that same farm. Yep, that was an operational farm for a long time. And then the high school ended up buying up the land. Oh, actually, I guess it became a golf course before it became the high school. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It was kind of kind of neat to see where the, you know, on your map where the where it may have come from. Yes, it, it is. And my my children went to the high school, and so every time I went to the high school, you know, I think, wow, that whole goose thing with the the Hessian happened right there, you know, and you can still <laughs> see where. Yeah, it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Thank you very much, Apple. Appreciate you being here. I just want to say uh, thank you for making history come alive in Phoenixville. I'm really anxious to get the book. <laughs> oh, thank you, Angie. Please tell your kids I said hello. Uh, I Angie will. Was not only my, she was my substitute teacher a couple times when I was at Barclay, I think. She was a bus, were you the bus driver? You were never the bus driver. That was Miss Castleman. But I had her kids. Yeah, I had several of her kids in fifth grade. Yeah, so. and Laura would have been here, but she had to put her kids to bed tonight and didn't have help. So. <laughs> Our kids have kids now. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. Oh, we 
got a little comment here. Let's see how I open that up. Oh yeah, the maps. Ah, yeah, Gene writes to everybody about the maps. If you get a chance to go down to the Historical Society on Church Street, they're open every Wednesday, Friday, and I do believe we're trying to get a weekend day open as well. And uh, yeah, tons of maps on the wall there, already framed. You don't even have to go into archives to look for them. They're right up against the wall. And boy, I, I already spent a half hour looking at the one. It's incredible. Yeah, folks, if you have not been to the Historical Society Museum, oh, it's definitely worth the trip. A lot of great stuff there. All right, we have no further comments or questions. I guess we'll call it an evening. Joe, thanks so much for being with us and sharing everything and uh, making the history come alive, as they said, and uncovering some really fascinating aspects of Phoenixville history, too. Oh, thank Check you very much book. for having me. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.